Well, good morning. It sounds like <clears throat> sounds like you're all ready. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see if we can control the feedback. Take out some of our electronics here. Not sure if that's going to do it or not. Sounds better. Good morning. Uh, maybe a little better. Move this down. See how that works. Uh, again, good morning. I'm Rick Barton, uh, the co-director with Karen Von Hippel, who I think is here in the room uh, of the post-conflict reconstruction project. And on behalf of John Hamry, our, our president here at CSIS, it's really a great pleasure to have all of you here today. Uh, I know that many of you have been involved with this issue of PRTs over the last uh, couple of years. And in fact, I'd, I'd be a little bit curious how many people have actually served on a, a PRT or been out in the field with one. So we've got a good initial, uh, and how many people have worked on the design and, and the development of the PRTs here or the leadership of them here in Washington. So it's really a good representation, I think, of, of some people that have been involved. We were hoping to get make this maybe the first uh, alumni reunion uh, but I guess there's still a bit of work to be done in, in terms of building the, the, uh, the cadre. But thank you all for coming and thanks for your service out there in the field. Those have been really incredibly challenging uh, situations. And of course, we visited a number of these places ourselves over the last few years and, and uh, helped to prototype some of this kind of same sort of idea uh, going back to Haiti in the mid-1990s. So it's, it's, uh, it's really one of these critical experiments that needs to be developed if we're going to become more effective as a country in these conflict uh, zones. And what's great about our guest today, uh, Congressman Vic Snyder, is that he too is uh, tremendously committed to the idea of improving the way we operate in the field, to our effectiveness, to our interagency approach. Um, he's dedicated a great deal of time and the talent of his staff, and we thank them for their work as well. Uh, to addressing the shortcomings of the U.S. government, but also just improving those things that we do well. And I think the PRTs probably fall into both categories. So it's a great pleasure to, to have Congressman Snyder here today. I think uh, what, what he's going to do is speak for 10 or 15 minutes. Then we'll have a bit of a conversation and include uh, all of you in the questions. And again, as usual, we'd ask you to please identify yourselves. Uh, this is being recorded. It should be up on the website within uh, 24 hours, and it looks as if we'll have a video as well as the audio. Uh, so we need to know who it is that's asking the questions for, for, the, uh, for the audience that's not here with us right now. So great to have you all. Congressman, thanks for your work, and great to have Thank you here you. today. Thank you, Rick. It's good to be with you. Is this like WCSIS television? <laughs> oh, live from downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> It is good to be with you uh, this morning. I think I'll sit here until somebody says they can't hear me very well. Um, you know, I walked in and they gave me this microphone, and I have to share this one story. You know, and then they turned it on. My my uh, wife is a minister back home, and she taught me early on the the most important. I know there's some young people here and some interns here today. The most important thing you may want to learn from this today is when you have one of these microphones, be sure it's off when you go in the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was a minister back home, true story. I know somebody who was at the, the congregation. He decided just before he'd go out for the beginning of the service to go in the bathroom. And unfortunately, he had his microphone on. The congregation was full, big full house. And so they sat there for about five minutes listening to this, you know, wonderful sounds from his bath. When he came out, they gave him a standing ovation. And that, <laughs> that was the beginning of the service. So I wanted to uh, spend a few minutes and talk about our report and then just really hear your either comments or questions or thoughts, and if there's things that I don't know much about, and there probably will be, we've got some of the staff members here, both from the committee staff, my personal staff, that, that worked on, on uh, this report. I want to say just a word about, uh, we called this thing, I, what do we call a report? Uh, agency stovepipes versus strategic agility. And I wanted to just comment about the word strategic agility, because I think we kind of struggle a little bit with what exactly what, what do we think our foreign policy apparatus ought to look like as we're looking ahead? I, you hear some people use the, the term smart power. I don't have any problems with that. Uh, it implies that we're, we ought to not just be about our military. We ought to be about our diplomacy, about our economic power, about our moral force in the world. What I like about the phrase strategic agility is it implies that 
there may be things we need to do tomorrow that we can't do right today, but we're agile enough, we can pull things together and move and adapt to changing situations. And um, I think what we have learned, unfortunately, the hard way perhaps in the last several years in both Iraq and Afghanistan is that we're not as agile as we perhaps had hoped we were, perhaps not as agile as we thought maybe we had learned to be in Bosnia, uh, that we still have uh, some work to do. Uh, this this uh, report came from our House Armed Services Committee, Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Let me say a word about that, a few political junkies. When the Republicans took over in uh, 1993, uh, they eliminated the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Uh, I, I, think, I, I wasn't here then. I think it was part of their kind of cutting back on the size of government, looking for ways where they could save money in the legislative branch. I think they thought that oversight could be done by you know, the Military Personnel Committee and the Readiness Subcommittee. And, uh, well, it didn't work. And in the view of a lot of us, oversight has been really abysmal uh, over the Pentagon or military. Um, any oversight done by the Armed Services Committee has just not been very effective or sustained as it ought to be. And so when the Democrats took back control at the year and a half ago, one of the things that we did was reinstitute the Oversight Investigation Subcommittee. And Ike Skelton used to serve on that committee, now our full committee chair, and so he was a strong uh, b believer in it. You may recall that Marty Meehan was the first subcommittee chair. The committee worked with Lori Fenner, the staff director for the subcommittee on um, oversight investigations. They, for the first six months, we worked on a report on the training of Iraqi troops. That report was finished, and then Marty resigned and went to a, a college in Massachusetts, and Ike asked me to take over the, the chairmanship. And what we did originally is we did a series over a month in July a year ago a series of hearings on what next in Iraq. And we brought in, brought in retired generals and think tankers and just, we call it our third way series. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're, we're taking the situation where we're at in Iraq today, where do you think we should go? And the, the committee members, both Republican and Democrat, really liked the discussions that we had. I think it informed a lot of people about ways to think differently about and looking ahead towards Iraq. But then the question became, well, where do we go from there? And, and it seemed to me that it was important, that, number one, that we stay hooked in with what's going in Iraq. And, and that was part of why we did the PRTs. But second, this issue has been floating out there for some time. A lot of work going on in think tanks, a lot of discussions going on in the Pentagon and the State Department about the whole issue of the relationships uh, between the different agencies of our government. And a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with what's going on. Um, and so we decided to undertake a look at the provincial reconstruction team partly just in our oversight function of how are they doing, wh where, what kind of help do they need from us, what kind of obstacles are there in government, either statutory or, or by, by policy. Um, uh, but also with the idea that perhaps as we look at these, it will also be a keyhole uh, that will let us get a view of well, what is going on with the different agencies of government, how they relate, how are they doing on this specific project. And I think our overall conclusion is that that Number one, it was worthwhile looking at the PRTs as an end itself. And number two, it really did help us uh, get a feel for some of the challenges w that we have with regard to uh, uh, the workings of, the, uh, of our different agencies of government. Um, right off the bat, one of the things that we figured out was we used the, I'll use the term PRTs, and we had a couple of former PRT members who we, we had some private meetings with them that said, you ought to not even call them PRTs because the, the, the work that they do, the PRTs do in Afghanistan is so dramatically different from the work they do in, in Iraq. Why do we call them the same thing? Because it gives the impression the American people and the government and the, the Congress that they're all doing the same thing. And my simplistic uh, understanding of that is that in Afghanistan when these things started, they were much more project oriented. Let's see what we can do to build a school. Let's see what we can do to build a water system. In Iraq, as things evolved, they were much more focused on capacity building in government. Let's see what we can do to help the local officials figure out how to get everything together they need to build a school. Let's see how we can help the local health departments get together to do immunization programs. So th that, that was uh, uh, one of the differences. Th one of the other things that we early on figured out is just some remarkable, I'm not really saying this in the spirit of you over here who are part of these PRTs, this is not suck up language. Uh, but really are remarkable people uh, who step forward uh, and, and work on these PRTs, and that continues to be the situation today. And 
I guess a couple thoughts about that. One is they're such remarkable people uh, that they had a lot of success. Uh, the other side of that is I think they would have had a lot more success if we on the other, the rest of the government had done our part in supporting them with structures and chains of commands and clarity of goals and ways of lessons learned and all those kinds of things. But they're really some mar remarkable people uh, that, uh, that serve on these things. And, and for a lot of them, I think it was just a wonderful time in their career, a, a life-changing kind of experience. Um, I had dinner, a group of us had dinner with Michael Hanlon a couple weeks ago. And, and O'Hanlon has been one of those, well, I, I guess I won't characterize his position on the Iraq War, but one of the things that he said in 2001, early 2002, while we were having this debate going on in this country about uh, the possibility of a war with Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein, is that one of the, the positives he thought with regard to our going into Iraq was, I think his words were something like, uh, we were, we, were, we were reasonably good at development of other countries. And I asked him about that quote the other night, and he said, well, I wasn't right on everything. <laughs> and, and I think what happened was that people looked at what had happened in Bosnia and thought, yeah, we're reasonably good at development. But now we look at what has occurred in, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and we're not saying that we're reasonably good at that anymore, that it really is a challenge, and we do have a, a lot to learn. One of my constituents has served both in Afghanistan and Iraq. He has, I think maybe is still a Department of Agricultural employee and uh, is a veterinarian and has been working, uh, has worked in both these countries, really loves it, has her family's come over to my house several times and she's got kids, but she just really is hooked on the importance of doing this for her country to help these people in these other countries. And we had some email, my staff has been emailing with her back and forth, and we quote her in this report, but I'll read to you her report uh, in what she says, if I don't have my glasses on. Oh, she said that, that it, st it struck her that she says, the cultural barriers between the military, Department of State, and other civilian agencies seem more striking than those between the United States and the Iraqis to me. We say the right things about breaking out of stovepipes, but our comfort level tends to put us right back in the mindset, the language, and our ways of doing business within our own agencies. Now, that was somebody who was over there at the time who was saying, I think the differences between our agencies are greater than our relationships with the Iraqis. Now, that, that has got to be uh, of, of concern uh, to us all. And she didn't get fired, by the way, after we published that uh, quote in the report. Um, so, you know, we, in the course of talking with former PRT members, one of the things that comes out is they work real hard, remarkable people, a lot of them felt like they had success, but also they all shared certain frustrations. And from those frustrations, uh, you know, it's where we start tracing, okay, what, what leads to some of those frustrations? That kind of work is always going to be hard. It's always going to have frustrations. But are there things that we should have been doing differently in the government to, to, to eliminate some of those? Um, and so I'll just go quickly through some of these things in which the report discusses in, you know, in a lot of detail. One of them is there was a, it was a lot of improvisation. They didn't really get a lot of, of strategic guidance. They didn't get a lot of oversight, uh, particularly early on. Uh, one person described it as it was like a pickup game. Uh, they could kind of reinvent themselves in, in, uh, and had to reinvent themselves in the areas uh, that they were assigned. Uh, but uh, we as a government didn't do a very good job of, seeing, of helping them see where they fit into the, into the whole broad picture of what we were trying to do in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the, um, Chain of command. This is a, this is the report. It's online. We have some copies here. If you haven't seen it, this is very artful cover, right? You know, kind of your typical cover. Nice pictures of good people trying to do good things for for, for communities. But on page 21, this is what I wanted the cover to be. Was this chart that was provided by with the Department of Defense, and I wanted this to be on the cover with the title: If you understand this, you don't need to read it. And because they came up with this chart to try to explain the chain of command and, and, and how these inter the, all these agencies relate, and nobody can understand. You look at that and think, what the hell is this? And uh, so, you know, uh, but, but part of the problem is what is the chain of command? And that, you know, that starts right here in Washington, and, and those, those things were not very clear. The second thing is when you have areas of really good people trying really, good hard, uh, trying really hard to do good things for their country and for the, the country where they're living, uh, good things happen. But a lot of that becomes personality dependent. 
if you have good people that can work together, good things can happen. And probably the best example of that right now is we see, you know, the Petraeus Crocker team is kind of in great harness together, and we all have some apprehension. Okay, when they go elsewhere, well, how will the next team in harness do? And we're optimistic we'll have good players there. But we shouldn't have a system which which becomes dependent uh, so much on j the personalities. Another part of that is the the funding streams and. Um, Similar kind of thing. Another chart that was prepared for the briefings. This one on page 23 of your of your hymnal. And um, I don't understand this one either. But the nice thing about it was that the the briefers, um, when they presented this the, the staff briefing, acknowledged that it really took them quite a while to put this kind of chart together. Now it looks to me kind of like a donut with some other donuts around it. That it wouldn't be that hard. But it, they put. A lot, I appreciate them for for, put, for working hard on it. But the fact that they had to work so hard to come up with something that is hard to understand gives you a sense of the complexity of funding streams right now. And, and if you're a PRT person, you don't want complexity in your funding stream. You want to understand it very rapidly, what, what kind of funds you have available and how you can use them. Another issue, it goes back to the sense of, a, you know, what's the nature of a pickup game? The nature of a pickup game is uh, you may, out there in the court, want a six foot six center but what you have is a another five foot ten guard, and that's who you have to use for that game that day. That's the nature of a pickup game, and you know there was very public discussions between Secretary Rice and Secretary Gates about staffing of these things uh, uh, in Iraq, <laughs> and we still have uh, those challenges. Uh, Secretary Gates, and I brag on him, I brag on him every chance I can. Uh, he is the most zealous advocate right now for USAID in the Department of State, probably starting with his Kansas State speech that. Some of us have quoted a bunch of times, in which he says we need dramatic increase in funding for the Department of State. We need dramatic increase in funding for USAID. We need a dramatic increase in personnel numbers for the Department of State. We need dramatic increase in personnel numbers for USAID. And it's all part of this smart power strategic agility. If you don't have the players out there, how can you be agile when you're trying to put to get, put something together that's more than just just a, a pickup game? Well, that was that's part of the problem. That was part of the challenge of the of the of the uh, Secretary of State trying to, and the other agencies, they don't have the kind of redundancy that the military builds in for training and those kinds of things. Another challenge that we think is that there hasn't been a very good job of, of gleaning the lessons learned from these remarkable people that are working in difficult situations and having some successes despite some of the <coughs> intricacies of the government behind them, but there hasn't been a very formal way of learning those lessons. Uh, and in fact, that may be an institutional problem we have with the government because we heard some people, I think, formally in our hearings and the staff heard informally, that there are people who say, well, you, you, you could have learned from the CORDS program in Vietnam and avoided some of these mistakes. But you should have gone back further than just, well, what happened in Bosnia? What happened in Somalia? What, you know, what happened in Haiti? I mean, you could have learned goods and bads and, and at, at a minimum, we need to be learning now from from what has occurred this month and last month and last year in Iraq and Afghanistan and turned into something um, positive. Um, and then the, the, the whole issue too of how do you judge, it's part of the lessons learned, how do you judge success? Um, and that's, that's tricky in this kind of a situation. Um, we had one person who felt that, uh, and, and, and meant this Positively, and I, I, I understand the sentiment, having worked overseas myself, that when they first went in, they, they, they sensed a lot of reluctance as part of the local population, but by the, as months went by, that people would wave when they went by. Well, okay, that is positive, and I understand that. That's pretty hard to, hung, to hang, you know, millions of dollars of taxpayers, I mean, millions of taxpayer dollars on, say, the waving quotient went up over six months. We've got to, I think we need to have something more than that, particularly when what you're trying to do is not just build projects. You know, we, did, we built three water systems and they're now supplying this much water, but when you're trying to increase the capacity of people to govern themselves, how do you measure that? And, and that's one of the, one of the challenges. Um, well, those, so those are some of the kinds of things and broad outline that are discussed in the report and the report sees, um, it goes in a lot of uh, details about those. Part of all that led to, I think, some really healthy discussions in the Congress with the help of think tankers and retirees and current government workers on broader issues of our foreign policy. And so, what, so some of the things that came out of that is in the defense bill that has passed the House and since it's not yet quite, quite done their version, 
Uh, we have included some things in that bill that deal specifically with these, with these PRTs. Uh, one of the things we did was include Sam Farr's bill, which came to the Foreign Affairs Committee, passed the House, but has a hold on it by one of the senators who didn't like the bill. We took it, worked with Chairman Berman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, took that exact language and put it in the defense bill and said, okay, put a hold on the defense bill. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing. Let's try it another, try it, find another vehicle, Sam Farr's bill that deals with the Civilian Reserve Corps, so the State Department would have a, a better ability to find the kind of personnel uh, that they want and need. Uh, we sent an email and provided this to Ambassador Crocker and I suggested, you know, we'd love to see you sometime when you're in DC and it wasn't very long at all before he said, I'm gonna be there, can I meet with your committee? And we sat down with him, was that last week or the week before, I think, and, and had a very positive discussion with him. And I think a lot of these things, <coughs> very experienced guys are already working on these things, but I think that some of the things the report talked about um, with a with a different set of eyes, I think has been been helpful been helpful to them. And we got some feedback from the embassy in Baghdad that they're working on on some uh, some of these things too. W one of the lingering issues is we're not clear what the what the exit strategy is for all this. How do you go from a PRT to an area that's safe enough that the normal NGO community can be working there, or the other agencies of government that can work there? It's not clear, or the other international NGOs, it's not clear yet how that is all going to work, and maybe it's not going to be clear until, until it occurs. I think that's all I'm going to say, Rick, about that, that report. I want to touch on this other one. As part of what occurred as we were talking to, to representatives of the PRTs and, and agency heads, is it became clear that there was a lot of, um, uh, I don't want to say confusion or lack of clarity on the whole benefits packages for civilians who serve in war zones. Now, we as members of Congress, we spend a lot of time worrying about how we treat our veterans, how we deal with PTSD, how we support families. We don't spend very much time at all worrying about civilians who are assigned or volunteer to go to a war zone from all the agencies. And I don't think the agencies have thought through that a lot either because the numbers, the reality is the numbers of you know, people from USVA are relatively small compared to the, the number of their employees. Uh, but it is a, it is a, a real uh, issue of concern. I'll give you a couple of examples. And I, I, the poor worker comp, federal worker comp people are probably tired of me talking about this, but it was that we had them testifying one day. There was, I think, workers comp and USDA and somebody from the State Department. And so I presented a scenario. I said, let's suppose I'm a civilian and I'm in Iraq. And I've got, I work all the time, but I've got this one hour, I've got a basketball sitting there, I've got my music playing, I'm writing letters, so I'm pres I presented a situation that was clear it was not work related. And I'm sitting there and a mortar comes in and I'm wounded. Am I covered by workers' comp? And the answer was, well, it would depend on all the facts. We have to take each situation individually. I said, you're kidding, right? And the, the, the woman who was sitting next to him or down the table, was very concerned because she worked for the State Department and was going to Iraq in like two days. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are you saying? What are you saying? You can't, you know, well, it took six weeks to get a written response that, well, yes, they, they, would, they would, be, would be covered. But that kind of, what, what most of us would think is the most basic situation and the most basic assurance that you would give to somebody uh, as a civilian going there. There's others even, um, uh, this is another example. After the report came out, we heard from one of the military organizations, they had a situation where they had a, I think it was in, Lori may help me with this, but they were doing, I think, a, either a criminal investigation or an investigation of a contract or something, and they happened to have a civilian and a military uniform person that were a, a team, and they were traveling around, I think it was Iraq, doing investigatory work, and they were sitting next to each other when they were both killed. And the family was real upset because of the, the, the honors, uh, how the burial was done. It was different for the civilian, even though they were doing exactly the same work and, and subjected to all the same risks. And, and we as a nation need to be sensitive. If we're going to expect more and more of these wonderful people, some of whom are with us here today, who serve in a civilian capacity, we've got to recognize their sacrifices uh, too, and that includes PTSD and dealing with family support and all those kinds of things and, and we probably haven't done as good a job on that. And this, so this report came out separately about that, which I think has helped, if, if nothing else,
policy agencies, uh, the other agencies of government say, this is something that we need to look at, and we have seen some, some improvement in that. Um, the final thing I think I want to just say is one of the things that we're going to do as a committee uh, starting probably July <coughs> heading before we recess for the year is, uh, and we're starting this, you know, we're just a little subcommittee with very small staff, but we're going to try to look at this whole issue of, what, you know, what's the grand strategy for the United States? Uh, where does all, where, where does all this fit into a, a big look at what foreign policy in the United States, what we ought to be looking back at, at as we go ahead 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years down the line. And Mr. Skelton, like Guy does do so much, he's, he's stealing one of our ideas. And so we're hoping to have a, the first part of this will be at the full committee level. I think it'll be great. Uh, and we're going to see if we can get some, you know, higher former secretary of state or one or two but to talk about, this, w let's step back. You know, we've been focused so much on Iraq, Afghanistan. Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups. Let's step back. What should be the things that we're thinking about? Should be thinking about, and then we're going to follow that up with uh, some think tank people and retired generals. And I mention that because all this talk about PRPs and how they do and our ability to develop and, and strategic agility and all these kinds of things are tools. Are tools that should help us achieve uh, what our our strategy is, our foreign policy strategy is for this country. And, and it may be that we're, we're overdue as a nation to sit back and have some discussions about what we think about the Pacific, what we think about Europe, what we think about changing technology. And so we're hoping to be part of that discussion. Rick, I've probably have gone longer than no, 10 minutes, good. but yeah. we'll just respond to any <laughs> questions or, or criticism. We accept, I'll accept the compliments, the staff will accept the criticism. So. <laughs> well, great, thanks very much. I think maybe the place to start is where you finished. And if, if you're gonna be, uh, looking at the grand strategy, obviously one of the significant issues will be what do we do in these kinds of places, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, possibly Nigeria, whatever the, whatever the uh, future is going to bring to us. And you also mentioned Secretary Gates' speech and, and the rather broad recognition that we don't have the civilian capacity that we need. I think the average American taxpayer is looking for trade-offs, is wondering, okay, so, so does that mean that Secretary Gates and Secretary Rice are going to go together to the Hill, where a lot of people say the problem is, and ask the appropriators to make some trade-offs, to take some weapon systems and put it into addressing these kinds of problems, or uh, looking at another way of not just plussing up or not just finding a supplemental. Do you see any any uh, uh, desire uh, among your colleagues, or, or as you look at a, a grander strategy, to to take on the problem <clears throat> in in that way, or is it uh, how will it be done? I, I I think well, I think several things. First of all, I think there is a, a part of what I applaud Secretary Gates for is he made these comments with full knowledge that he has a lot of financial needs in the military right now in terms of of. Uh, you know, we're, we're increasing the size of the military, which is going to bring legacy costs uh, for a long time. Um, the uh, cost of uh, re uh, buying all the re replacement vehicles, all those kinds of things uh, from the war. So at the same time, he knows he has financial need and that it is increasing. He is saying, but wait a minute, if you want to be strategically agile, you've got to do a better job on the civilian side. and. And I think there's broad support for that in the Congress. One of the one of the issues is is funding, and I think, you know, we don't go into that kind of detail. I, but uh, that's you know, Mr. Spratt and I had those kinds of discussions that we had in this in the budget year, and uh, we did plus up uh, some of the State Department activities. But that's going to be an on ongoing discussion, Rick. But I don't think we should. I don't. Uh, my idea right now is we should not say, here is the pool of money for our national security. That's it forever. Now you all fight it out down here. I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure that's going to be how you're going to get what in Secretary Gates' words, dramatic increases in the number of State Department employees and USAID employees and the money that they have to work with. I think we have, we whacked at that. It was an easy hit for Congress for years, and we have paid the price for it. In terms of the clarity of goals uh, or the improvisation that you talked about, how do you think? Uh, what do you see as a way to, to produce 
more clear goals and for these PRTs and in these kinds of places? I, I think, I mean, the report is pretty detailed about some of all these things. The, the part of it is lessons learned. Part of it is, is there needs to be a, you know, this is, this is, what these folks are trying to do is, are build, help, is help countries build at the same time there's a shooting war going on. And so that makes it much more complicated. So it becomes important for our government, for the Ambassador Crockers and the, and the General Petraeus to say, okay, if we're going to have them subject to that risk, we, even though we're in a shooting war, we've got to step back and say, where do they fit into this? Where do they fit into our strategic plan for this country? Um, it's got to be more than just saying, we promised that governor we'd do some work there, let's send a PRT there. I'm not saying that that occurred, but it's, it needs to have a sense of, of, uh, of, uh, of what, they're, what we hope to accomplish, what we think they can accomplish, and how that fits into the, into the bigger scheme of things. And that, and that starts in Washington, too. Let me ask one more question, and then we'll uh, move to the audience. Do you feel that the, uh, that the leadership cadre is deep enough, is skilled enough, uh, we talk about building a civilian reserve corps, um, but we could easily put hundreds of civilians underneath rather unprepared leadership. Do you, do you see that that being developed at the same time, or how is that being developed? Um, you mean like PRT leadership? Yeah, or f yeah, field leadership, PRT leadership. Yeah, I, I, I think that's all part of it, Rick. I think uh, I think there's remarkable people. I, I think there really is remarkable people out there. I think we have remarkable people in this country. What I don't think we did such a good job is of pulling all those people together to get the best fit for the PRT, um, uh, for the PRTs always. Uh, and part of that is the leadership level. Part of that is, you know, uh, the uh, one of the basic issues is, well, who should be the controlling person? Should it be the civilian person? Should it be the, the military person that varied between Iraq and Afghanistan? But it's, I mean, I think it's just all part of the, part of the, picture if we get the right set of skills and part of those skills are leadership skills, some of them are veterinarian skills, some of them are language skills, some of them are sewer system skills, but that's just all part of, of uh, having the group of people with the skills you want and knowing who those people are. Let me move to your questions and again if you've, uh, why don't we start right here, we'll go here, here, number, the second question. Uh, Rick, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Rick. I'm Rick Olson. I'm the senior advisor to Stuart Bowen, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. And uh, this is not suck-up language either, but your committee, <laughs> Congressman, has done superb work in the PRT arena. And the report that you uh, mentioned several times, a first-class piece of work, so thanks for that. Thank you. I'd acknowledge Lori Fenner and I'm, yeah, she did the great staff work here. did a great job. The, um, uh, a lot of the, the issues raised in the report that you raised in the presentation here really flow from one essential question, and that's who's in charge. Uh, and I was the CJTF commander in Afghanistan and the director of the National Coordination Team in Iraq. It was fairly clear in the theater who was in charge. You know, we can argue about what kind of job we did, but it, the, the chain of command was not in doubt. The, the issue, though, and this is kind of following Rick's question, about goals and about leaders. The real question is who's responsible for establishing goals, establishing doctrine for PRTs, developing leaders who can be on the bench and go into the theater uh, when, the, when the time comes. So it's kind of what the military guys call proponency. Who has proponency for PRTs? Uh, back, here in, back here in Washington, will it be the Department of Defense uh, or will it be the Department of State? Uh, and I was just wondering, uh, Congressman, if the committee has developed uh, any thoughts or if there's any sense in the committee about whether or not it ought to be a DOD responsibility or a Department of State responsibility uh, to develop doctrine, to develop leaders, to train, and that type of thing. Lori, Sorry. I, I can't remember if we did, I don't know if we specifically said that an agency. Yeah, well, we didn't. Uh, yeah, I don't think we did. You need her to need Lord to have a microphone. Sure, that's, that's a good idea. Good. Yeah, we'll we'll miss your valuable words otherwise. Thank not. you, uh, Lori Fenner from the ONI staff. Yeah. Um, we didn't go as far as to make that kind of recommendation, but something that uh, Mr. Berman and Mr. Skelton did do in legislation was to establish on the House side. Of course, this has to still go through conference to establish an advisory council, kind of like the Defense Science Board that will advise both the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State on the kinds of stability and reconstruction and other 
kinds of things that require interagency operations. Um, so be watching for that to go through conference, and if you want to call your senators, you could support that. So because they would advise Congress and state and defense. One of the issues that that is that was our is that's our way and Mr. Skelton and Mr. Berman's way and they're working very closely together. We're all you know we've had people from Fort Bragg sitting on our committee. That's our way, given the jurisdictions that we have of dealing with this issue of the interagency stuff. We didn't include we if, we didn't include agriculture and justice and you know but we we got state and DoD as a start on that. Um, as you go further on up. We have had discussions about well, when you talk about who coordinates the whole interagency. Well, should that be in the National Security Agency? Where, I mean, where should that be? And it's not. I, I think that's part of this ongoing discussion that we're going to that we're having and ha we'll have, and you all are going to be participating at is where should this interagency reform? Where what should the endpoint be? And I don't think I don't know what the endpoint should be, but I think it will impact on the on the question that, that you ask. And right now, it means there's a little bit of floundering around. To try to sort it out uh, until it's clear, and it's not clear right now. Maybe something will come from from this. One, one of the things we did, uh, and it, it didn't get the kind of press attention I thought it might have deserved, but uh, about two months ago, we suggested, Mr. Skelton, that we have Secretary Gates and Secretary Rice testify jointly before the Armed Services Committee, and they did. And because what we focused on was this issue of how the agencies work together. Well, the press reported, I think, what was going to be funded through the supplementalists. I mean, it kind of got, and it got really down the weeds. But the, but the bigger issue, what, what they were excited about talking about, was what you just asked. How are we going to resolve these questions about who, uh, when you have a blend of personnel and functions about who controls? Secretary Gates said State Department needs to control a lot of this development stuff. He was very clear about that. It's not clear to how is it all going to play out? It just goes on down the line. You know, you give the longer answers when you don't know how it's going to come out. You know <laughs> Mark. Uh, Mark Schneider, uh, Senior Vice President of the International Crisis Group. Uh, Congressman, I think that everybody is going to uh, laud the work that the uh, subcommittee has done on this issue. And the We're just proud that you've actually read the report. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of things. One is it seems to me when you talk about doctrine, there's, there's a focus on the sort of the, the U.S.-led PRTs, oh, right, well, yeah. and obviously you've got another 14 that are yeah. led by others. Yeah. Each one of them somewhat different. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious as to whether or not um, there's been any further discussion about how you get a, a unified doctrine in terms of mm -hmm. the international PRTs. Oh, yeah. um, and, and second, as you talk about how do you get the transition, how do you make the transition into um, a situation where it is civilian-led because there's no longer the security issue that required the yeah. PRT in the first place in certain areas? Yeah. And what are, the, what are those um, sort of benchmarks for moving towards civilian-led and really an Afghan government, hopefully, led uh, development and reconstruction effort in areas where you no longer have serious uh, security problems. Yeah, um, let me, and we didn't get into a lot of the detail on your second question there, but we, we, here's the scenario that we, which has occurred and which will, will, you know, God willing will occur more and more, which is as you transition to where we say U.S. forces don't need to be in this area, this is going to be an Iraqi security zone or an Afghan security zone. Well then, what does that do to your American-led development people who say, "No, let me let me get this right. I'm going to be going, you know, I'm not a soldier. I'm a civilian. I'm going to be going in only with Iraqi-led troops in this area that was a, a U.S. sector." And and I'm not sure how folks are going to feel about that. How that's going to work right away. And then the next step then is the NGO. I don't have an answer for your question. I think it, I think it is one of the challenges of doing all this development work in the midst of a shooting war, and it's a shooting war that does not have lines. You can't say, hey, as long as you stay south of this trench, you're okay. That's not the way it is. And I, I don't have a good answer for it. And tell me, your first question again was? Sort of the international yeah. side of it. All right, yeah. We took advantage, what was the group, Lori, that did the evaluation of the? Yeah, the, we, we, we stole some of their work, because they, we did not spend a lot of time with the international-led PR. PRT. The Italians have a team. There's several countries that have 
have teams, but we do talk about it some in the report, and it's just part of the complexity. Uh, their, their conclusion was, I think, that some of them are doing really good work, and there's things to be learned from what they're doing, but it's just part of the, part of the complexity, uh, uh, because not only do we have variances between what the U.S. PRTs are doing in Afghanistan versus the PRTs in Iraq versus the embedded PRTs in Iraq, but there are obviously differences between how each country puts them together, and that's one of the complexities. And again, I don't have a good answer other than uh, it would probably be helpful if there we have a more systematic uh, way of evaluating all of them. Let me get the, uh, Rob back here. Back. Have we heard from any former PRT members yet? Uh, I don't think so, all but right. there. But we'll don't hold back, friend. I'll just stall for time while they come up with questions. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, Rob Jenkins with USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. The PRTs were designed for Iraq and Afghanistan. And for obvious reasons, we have substantial levels of troops in both those countries. Do you feel that it's worth our time and effort to perfect the model and then export that to places where we might not have so many uh, troops on the ground of our own? And or should we spend time getting it right and maybe then advocate for putting U.S. troops on the ground in places that we haven't necessarily thought about? It? I, I, think that's, I think that's a perfect question because that's – what you want to have, that kind of evaluation when you talk about lessons learned. Lessons learned, to me, doesn't mean that, well, this worked really well for this, so we're going to apply that same model to the next situation. Uh, we talked, we mentioned the CORD program in Vietnam. Nobody is saying we've got to do exactly like we did in Vietnam, but part of that is, okay, what did we learn, what worked, didn't work, and why did it work there? Well, maybe one of the reasons it worked there is because of specific things distinctive to a, a shooting war in Iraq that you would, you would have a different model if you were elsewhere. I, I think that was just part of the ongoing of evaluation process if I understood your question. I think that uh, where, you have lower, where you have lower levels of conflict, uh, for example, in Liberia or yeah, Haiti, or Haiti yeah. um, we were able to set up some of these kinds of structures by just putting our civilians as close to the special forces as possible. So if they were down the street, we had, a, we had an office a block away. You could do that in that kind of a case, but and, and in other cases, we're going to have to probably do it almost all with local people rather than really having the insertion. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, I mean, Rob Rob has a very interesting program in in uh, in Pakistan that really calls on the on the Pakistani government and uses uh, the local government, not the national government, so much, and uses their assets for in a very creative way. So there are a lot of good examples out there that I think are being developed. Although in all those kinds of situations, I'll give you an example that I was involved in. It's just one little, many, many little detail in all this, but uh, I think it was in, uh, I, forget, I forget what year it was. It was, uh, it was at, at, toward the, the Civil War in Sierra Leone was about wound down. I used to, I worked as a doctor in Sierra Leone for six months, and so I've always tried to follow what's going on there. So I, I went there just as the UN troops were moving out. They'd moved in some areas, but they weren't everywhere where else. And that was also, you may recall, at a time when I think it was about 200 British troops were training the new Sierra Leone Army. And they asked the United States, would you pr please provide some troops so we can say this is a joint U.S.-British training force. And so we did. We provided three troops. Mm -hmm. One person of the Air Force, one Marine, and I forget who the other one was. Uh, so I'm a former Marine. So the Marine, I get there and I meet this young guy. I got two, one current and one former Marine right here. So this is a young, young guy tough guy, and he said, you know, we went out and thank for each other. I got to talk to you. I said, what's going on? Here's the situation. This is a true story. The day he came into the country, they were helicoptering him, I think, from Guinea because they didn't have any flights into uh, Sierra Leone. He said, I was on the helicopter. He said, literally, I was with an American woman who was 65 years old wearing a neck brace who came to work for a relief group. We landed in Freetown. She got into a uh, Jeep or something and drove off to Bo or someplace out in the rural area where she was going to work. I land, and the first thing the ambassador tells me is, you are prohibited by military regulation from leaving Freetown. You can't stay outside <laughs> of Freetown overnight. <laughs> and, and he said, she was wearing a neck brace. She, you know, <laughs> she was just so angry. Well, I got that resolved when I got back because I actually talked to the commandant about it. Well, come on now. You know, that, that's just one little example. I mean, and this, this is Ambassador Joe Melrose, who I mm -hmm. met with yesterday, mm -hmm. by the way. It drove him crazy. He said, the ambassador on the ground has got to be the one that makes that call. That can't be something set by the commandant of the Marine Corps that no Marine can't leave Freetown. That, 
so those are the kind of things yeah, that, sure. it, it, that we still have to struggle with. Very, very common. Yeah, one way in the back there, right? Yeah, he's from a PRT, so that's good. Uh oh, he's he's hiding back there. He's getting near the door. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Stan Byers. Uh, served on the Bamiyan PRT in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the limitations that we had, uh, I think, actually one of the reasons why Office Transition Initiatives that Rob's with is so effective, is the flexibility and funding that OTI has that we didn't have on the ground, and. We are often, uh, the people that we were working with knew we had to spend the money, and it was a requirement to just push through and get stuff done, rather than you know, to be flexible on what a changing situation required. And I was wondering whether the Congress had looked at that, because there is a need clearly for oversight, and whether it might make sense to take a page out of the book of the military, and can, instead of setting uh, funding goals that you have to spend so much, set objectives that you need to reach funding and then be ac held accountable for how well you meet those objectives, but have the flexibility to spend the funding as necessary. Yeah. My guess is if I advocated for that we need to judge agencies by their ability to spend a certain amount of money by a certain date, I would not win many elections. So I'm not in favor of that, <laughs> uh, that model. The only thing I can say is that the report discusses the funding issues in some detail but doesn't come up with, I think, a good resolution for it. But the conclusion was, is that here you had PRTs, and at the time they might need a certain kind of money or a certain amount of money, it wasn't always available. And it seemed easier for the, the military to be able to, to, to get their funding rapidly for whatever the military was doing apart from the PRTs. And that, that's not a good answer to the question, but I agree that it ought to be judged on, on what's achieved but it also needs to recognize that you're in a war zone. This is not the same thing as trying to get an appropriation bill through Congress. You need to have, you know, if you're trying to build capacity in an area and everybody's coming together and, you know, it's going great and, and you, you know, you promise, well, we're going to put up 10% of the funding for this water project and the Iraqis are going to put up the rest. You actually need to be able to do it like that. You don't need to say, well, I'm sorry, we thought we were going to have it. It's gotten bogged down again. So there's, you've got to have a fair amount of flexibility. You've got to have an understanding of where that's coming from. You've got to have a sense of what your budget is, what you can promise or not overpromise. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of still a lot of work that needs to be done on, on that area. Let's so uh, we have we now have a lot of questions. <coughs> can can we do a uh, can we group about three or four and, and uh, well, my see? memory's not very good, Rick. I'll right. put my pen out here. <laughs> but, but if we both like write a, it down, like, we may a be able to. like a lightning round. Uh, so why don't we just why don't we just get your comments if you can keep them really brief? I think we can get maybe five or so. Let's see if, how we do with them. Uh, why don't we start right here and then we'll move to the gentleman in the middle, Hamid, and uh, well, we're right there. If you if you're right there and you got a question, you're sure, and we'll move it up. Yeah, my name is Ashley Abbott. I was. Uh, with the Afghanistan PRT program for about two and a half years. I was in Kandahar, Helmand, and Zabul in the south with the Special Forces. Uh, so we do have people out there in the field, and that's how you do it. We put 7,000 kilometers on a land cruiser with small units moving around, mostly protected by Afghan troops as well as Special Forces ODAs, and that's how you get in the village. So I answer number one. Number two is we moved away from the OTA funding OTI and funding mechanisms way too quickly in Afghanistan. We went from a situation where we're still facing unconventional warfare in the South and a serious insurgency. We decided that it was a normalized, regularized mission and failed to apply the right timing principles and activities to the environment. Um, the enemy has a vote, the environment has a vote, and the war's not over just because we decided it was. Um, and uh, <laughs> hence, look at Argandab. So there are ways to do this. The funding mechanisms need to stay flexible. And yeah, it's a good idea to have strategic coherence because you need to be able to run the strategic programs in the foreign internal defense on the security side so that you have a coherent army and police seven years down the line. And that you have to be able to do the ministerial capacity building in the foreign internal defense mechanisms. But if you try to regularize, conventionalize, and strategize to the provincial and the district level, we will continue to fail because we're taking a big square box and putting big square conventional units in a place that has no, that we need to be adaptable, flexible to the environment and in the changing situation, not wait 275 days for funding approval or roll out only in labs where you can get to 5% of the roads in Kandahar province and let the insurgents take the other 95%. So 
Thinking about the big picture is important, but the big picture is going to depend on operational and tactical effectiveness, which gets right down to the details. So as nice as it is and as easy it is, as it is to write the PowerPoint five different times, if we're not executing on the ground, that's where we will fail, not up here, down there. So streamline the mechanisms to allow the flexibility on the ground. I don't know if we can do that anymore. I think that I, wouldn't, wouldn't this, she'd be a wonderful person to have a lessons learned discussion with in a formal well, way. I mean, one thing on yeah. the lessons learned, we finally got to the point where we said no more lessons learned. Yeah. I don't know. That was my office. I've talked to yeah. people in Good. the last year. I've um, never seen one report. They never get circulated. Yeah. It's a nice project for people, but you don't want to do it right and circulate and disseminate. Stop sending people down on trying to get work done. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I, I've got some bad news. I, 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 hope, I hope that we continue to send people down because the, the, situation, the situation changes. I, I, I really appreciate your comments. I think they're, they're, they're real good, real healthy. I, I want to make the one comment about the issue versus top down versus what's on the ground. And that, we, we, go, we have had that discussion that's in a variety of different ways. And it's like, baby bears porridge, it's got to be just right, which is you do not need to be out there on your own without a sense of where all this fits into the bigger picture. On the other hand, those folks who say, oh, hey, we've come up with this big picture, totally divorced from what the people are on the ground. Let's send more dictates down to them. That would be a terrible thing to do. And, uh, and how you do that blend is the challenge. And I actually think that <coughs> challenge right there, as just what you discussed, is the key to, if we solve that problem, then we will have dealt with this whole issue of interagency reform. Because that's the, that's the ultimate people on the, I guess I'll say boots on the ground question is, all that interagency stuff at both the top and down on the ground has to work so that you feel like you're getting the support you need and the guidance you need without being pushed into boxes that you shouldn't be pushed in. Yes, sir. Well, we're not doing much of a lightning round right now. <laughs> that, was a great, that was a great comment. I appreciate it. Do you think that microphone's on? Can you hear it? A little closer. Just hold it close to your mouth and see if that works. I don't know yet. No, it's not on yet. It doesn't seem like it's on. I have seen many of the work of the PRCs in Afghanistan, particularly in uh, Libya in most of the provinces. I think they have done a very fantastic job in some of the provinces. The capacity is different. Uh, you raised a couple of very good, good points. Uh, one was the how we judge the successes because that is the most important, that how we can feel that when will be the time that the Afghan can take the lead. Uh, on that sense, I think uh, the most important is that how we can expand the outreach in the security zone and then the capacity of the local governance that they can take the lead to lead the, the, the development aspect. And I think if we judge by that, that kind of a, a basis or criteria, I think we will be much more suitable then to have the number of projects implemented in a particular province. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And Ambassador Crocker feels that mm -hmm. way too. And what do they call that, Laura, the maturity model? I mean, it's a no, I think it's for you all that do development work, but that's what they're looking at. It's uh, for those of us, you know, who watch out for taxpayers' money, it's a lot easier to go back home and say, you know, we built 23 water projects last month in this area. It's a lot easier to talk about that when in reality the greater good may be to be able to say, well, the maturity model is looking better and better for governance. But, 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 it, but that's, I agree with you. Yeah. The second point is that um, the, the, the policy discussion at the strategic level, we are focusing on that, how we can streamline and synergize uh, uh, from the, the, the capitals down to the PRT on the ground level, uh, their command and structure and operation. Yes, that is a problem. But at the same time, we are less engaged in the discussion uh, uh, about the local interlocutors with whom they should mm -hmm. be engaged in, in, in the same kind of a principle and requirement and the benchmark to be discussed between, between the PRTs and the, the strategic level mm -hmm. with the local and, for instance, with that Afghan or Iraqi, that how they should be prepared and by which time that they can take all this responsibility in the, uh, because that is also not clear. I haven't seen a single document within our own government that they guide the, the governors or the, the provincial uh, yeah. departments that how they should work with the PRTs and how they could benefit effectively. So that needs a very clear engagement in both sides to make the work of PRT yeah. uh, successful. 
because currently what is happening is uh, it depends on the personality. A good governor, a good PRP commander, they are going coming together very effectively. For instance, looking to host, they change the, the whole face because there is a, a, a personality, there is a personality, and they are working together and they're making the difference. Uh, so that is that is another issue that m might be uh, useful to think about. In I think one of the, one of the uh, I forget who coined the phrase in all this, but uh, the phrase is, is interlocutor fatigue, which is where we've been talking about the frustrations of, of, uh, of our personnel. If you're a Iraqi or a local Afghan leader, an Iraqi leader, and personnel change, and you've had a variety of agencies come through, and you've got the military folks, and then they change, and you're trying to get a damn school built, or just trying to pull your, and the, and the personalities keep changing with varying language skills and different interpreters, I thought interlocutor fatigue was a pretty good phrase because the, the, the receiving end of that has got some frustrations too. I think we're going to have time for about uh, two more questions because I understand you may have votes. So uh, we could have a. Uh, why don't we do this? Uh, anybody from anybody from PRTs? Uh, What's going on here? Were you in a PRT? Okay, great. Why don't we go with you, and then we'll then we'll come come down over here. Uh, Hi, Lieutenant Colonel Linda Granfield, uh, former PRT commander in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. And uh, it goes to um, Minister Stanikzai's uh, point is how do we institutionalize those individuals that get it and that come out of the PRTs and are very effective working with their governors and, and, and get the trade because it's an art, it's not a science. And so for, for instance, myself and, and many of the former PRT commanders and, and aid reps come back and then they're lost and they're not in, you know, studying Afghanistan or doing anything with Afghanistan. And so I just think that at a point we've got to institutionalize those skills and it goes to lessons learned and, and create some sort of system and mechanism in order to employ those folks, you know, back into the field. Um, I think PRT commands and PRT should be there for two to five years, the same person, because you develop those relationships and I, I've been pushing this uh, quite frequently within OSD. And I know General um, Olson will disagree with me, but I don't think the Air Force and the Navy, and sorry folks, are the right fit for that. I mean, I'm an active duty civil affairs officer. I've been doing this for 15 years. F PRT command is exactly what I've been training myself to do you know, over those 15 years. And so I think we're missing some of the, the institutionalizing you know, that art and, and the skill set that needs to, to go with that. I think, I think that's a good point. I think that's all part of the strategic agility. I think that maybe the only thing I'd add to your good comment is uh, it's like anything else. It's finding the right people, but then also with the right level of training, the right level of support. But I, I'd add in one other thing, both in the civilian side and the military side, you've got to have the right incentives. You, and we've got to recognize that if you decide you stay there for a year or two or three, that it not only doesn't hurt your career, it enhances your career. That we recognize this is an, an important thing to do and you're going to get your uh, in, in uh, for prof professional military, military education will relate to it. We just have to continue to build those skills. It's, I guess it's similar to everything else the military does. You find good people that are appropriate for the slot and train them and l learn from what they've done and have them lead junior people in learning those skills also. I think the also the rotation policies are going to probably have to change certainly no, uh, across the government. That, that, and, that's, and, and the rotation policy uh, is part of the whole challenge of doing this in a war zone. I mean, th there's, I mean, I saw Ambassador Crocker the, the last week and, you know, I, I think he's probably ready to be out of that war zone. I mean, uh, you know, you start talking about saying, we start saying, okay, we need people willing to spend two to five years <laughs> in some very challenging environments in a shooting war. That's a pretty yeah. tough thing to ask people to do. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman right here in the middle. Thank you. Probably, probably the last was, uh, question, I think. International Relief and Development. I don't want to repeat. Uh, we're, by the way, we're the implementing partner, USAID implementing partner for community stabilization. I just flew in from uh, Al Ambar last night. What you said, ma'am, was very well put. And it, it, the 7,000 miles on the SUV getting out there, and Congressman, your story about the lady with the getting in the Humvee or the, the well, SUV and yeah. taking off. I'm sorry, I have to admit I didn't read the report. I just, like I said, got in late last night and was told about it a few hours ago. But we will get you a copy. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> working with the PRTs out in Al-Ambar, I've been out there for two and a half years, and the one thing I notice is they're very jealous of the fact that I move around and I interact with Iraqi peoples. In, in, in fact, I've lived in Ramadi since September of last year. I have over 600 Iraqi employees 
that, that's who's around me. So I have this knowledge when I need to go down and see the city council, no problem. When I need to interact with the DJ of water or sewage, he can come to my house and we have chai and we sit and we talk. The PRTs, I agree with you, Congressman, there are a lot of good people on them. Very smart with lots of stuff. They bring a lot of stuff to the table. But they can't get off the fob or when they do, it begs the question, who's in charge? They're riding in Humvees and they're wearing military uniforms. So when they get out, and, and they have very limited time, I mean, and, and I talk with them, they say, Travis, you know, we need to find out who's this person. Can you find out who's in charge of the library? Because I, I, I can only move on Tuesday. Have any, has anyone of the, of the PRTs or do you in your report talk about their frustration, their need to be able to move? And, and I yeah. think they're quite jealous of the fact no. that, that SNGOs are able to No, that was, that was a, that was a I issue. I mean, I think it was one of those basic things. Uh, I mean, people just describe it as pretty basic. If we don't, if we don't have the security side of this that has a sense of the, our importance, where they will put a priority on us going out, we will not get work done. If we're on the schedule to go to a certain area tomorrow, but we get every time something flares up somewhere, we get bumped because they see the pure military side of it as being more important, we're not going to get any work done. And that, that was a frustration level, a fr frustration that was expressed. There were also some other issues that were that came up with regard to this, the mix of civilian and military. And some people would have their civilian people be out of uniform, and that people got a little jumpy about that. Well, now, wait, you're having people in a war zone not in military attire. What does that mean for the rules of war? I mean, there was a, there's a lot of, there's some complexities on these issue of the nature of the, the, the blend of civilian and, and military. But the issue of transportation probably, it, I mean, it's just part of security, but probably second only to security was the, was the, most people felt was the critical thing. If you couldn't get to the area you're supposed to work in, you did nothing. Well, please join me in thanking Congressman Vic Snyder, and thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.